Hey Gearheads, it's Jeff with Gear Report here with another Philmont Scout Ranch backpacking gear rundown. This is a post-trek review of everything I carried on our June 2021 trek to Philmont Scout Ranch. We're gonna do this a little different than you'll find on some channels where they lay everything out on a neat table and it's all in rows and they just talk about stuff. That's only part of the puzzle. The other part is how you carry the stuff around. Organization in the backcountry goes a long way towards helping you get in and out of your camps more quickly, which leaves more time for taking in the amazing scenery and the cool programs in the backcountry at the various different staff camps at Philmont. So let's start out. I'll tell you the order we're going to go through this. How to get your stuff to Philmont. We'll talk about the stuff that you wear when you go on the trail, the stuff you carry on the outside of your pack, the stuff you carry on the inside of your pack. We might even get into tents and dining flies and that kind of stuff as well. So first, what I like to do, because we generally fly, I'm in North Carolina, Philmont is in New Mexico, we'll take a flight into Denver, typically, which happens to be geographically the country's largest airport. That's a whole lot easier if you have wheels on your bag. So I highly recommend some sort of wheeled bag. I've used a wheeled suitcase before. This happens to be more like a duffel bag. I believe it, the brand is Highland Tactical, and it really is just a big duffel bag that has wheels on the bottom and a pull-out handle on top, and that lets you pull things through the airport a whole lot easier to check your luggage. When you get to Philmont and you're pulling your stuff, you're taking your stuff through base camp, you might actually want to take it out of this bag. You can see where I drug it through the mud in base camp, because yes, it was rainy and muddy in base camp uh, last week. It was not easy to pull, so I would actually recommend, don't do it the way I did it, where you just pull it, put your backpack on, carry this empty with your hands. It's actually a whole lot easier than trying to drag this through the mud uh, if the mud's really bad. But that's how we get it there. Show you what's in here. I had some clothes for base camp and uh, don't forget your towel and washcloth and soap and stuff to use the, the showers while you're in base camp. That one is locked, someone's in there. That one is not locked, it is available. And I already put my stuff in here. And toilet, bench, shower, sink. There we go. I also had uh, trekking poles. This will be outside of the pack gear. So why don't we get into that first? Trekking poles. Some people love them, some people hate them. I really like them. I tend to be clumsy and they really help me when I'm hiking. By the way, this is how you use the straps, all right? You don't reach straight in and grab. The strap's not doing anything for you. Come up under it and then come down on it. Now, you don't even have to grip it when you hit it on the ground. Because you know, I've heard people, and I've had this problem before, when I held it the other way, gripping the trekking pole, the whole trek, would my hand would get crampy and numb. It's not used to gripping like that. so. This way, you don't even have to grip it. Uh, anyhow, trekking poles. I get clumsy. There are tons of rocks, roots, lumps, logs, all kind of stuff laying across the trail. You will trip at some point. Having the poles to be able to kind of jab out and sta stabilize yourself, as well as I like to look around while I'm hiking, especially in a beautiful place like Philmont. If I am hiking and I put the front one down, I can then look around while I'm getting up to it. I lose my balance some when I'm looking around. So helps me to stay stable and not fall down on the trail. I really like them. You can lean on them when you get tired. If you're using a tent that doesn't have tent poles, it uses trekking poles. Obviously you need trekking poles. These are Cascade Mountain Tech, the carbon fiber version on the last trek. Several of the guys had the aluminum version that looks pretty much identical. All of them worked wonderfully. What I will tell you is at Philmont, they really ask that you put uh, tip covers on your trekking poles. They don't like the little carbide tips that dig into the soil. And I'll tell you, there's evidence all over the place there of where the spikes dig in, they loosen the soil, then it rains and we have erosion issues. Here we see trekking pole damage on the side of the trail. Here we go. Put tips on your trekking poles. 
if you can take that carbide tip out of your trekking poles before you get there, go ahead and do that. At the minimum, put the little round covers over them. The problem with the round covers, the terrain is so rough and abrasive there that they wear through very quickly. You may need, I think these were too heavy, silly, just ridiculous looking, but after wearing out several sets of trekking pole tip covers on the 2017 trek, when I went back in 2021, I said, you know what? These may be big and clunky, but I'm gonna try them. They worked beautifully. I could do another trek right now. I'd probably do five or six more treks before wearing those out. Whereas the round ones, I'd need three or four sets to get through a trek. These are definitely the way to go. And I highly recommend trekking poles, especially if you're not 16 anymore. A little bit older, you probably need more. Other stuff we're gonna wear on the outside. I typically wear this visor because I like ventilation, but on the trail with so much sun coming down, I don't want the back of my neck to get burned. So I got this ridiculous looking big floppy hat. Ridiculous because it's got this flap that hangs down. It is absolutely wonderful when it's hot and the sun is blazing down to have a little shade on your shoulders and the back of your neck and not have to worry about getting burned back here. And then when it rains, the rain doesn't run down the back of your neck and down the back of your shirt which is also nice. If you get a hat like this, you can fold them up and tuck them in your pack. Make sure you get one where the brim has a little bit of uh, stiffness to it. Otherwise, when it rains, it's gonna get soggy and hang down in your face, and then you can't see where you're going, and that kind of sucks. So we want to be able to see where we're going. This has good ventilation. This and all the products that we talk about are available to you in our Philmont Backpacking Gear Guide. It's the, it was a budget backpacking gear for Philmont. It's on Gear Report, and there will be a link in the description to that article where you can find all of these. You will have to get your own Philmont brands on your hat, though. Sorry, those are mine. Also on the outside, we have footwear. This can be a highly debated topic. There are people who say you have to have boots because it's so rocky and uh, roots and everything everywhere. You will twist an ankle and come off the trail if you're not wearing hiking boots, is what they say. Personally, I've done three treks, one in boots, one in low top shoes, and one in mid shoes and I didn't have any issues with ankle support on any of them. I've read some pretty good scientific articles that suggest the ankle support provided by boots is really a myth. That rigidity on the side of a boot transfers, if you twist your ankle, it just transfers that uh, stress up a little higher in your ankle. So instead of getting a low ankle sprain down at the bottom, you get a high ankle sprain. Uh, and I can tell you from personal experience, hockey skates, the boots on those are much stiffer. They're like, you know, really stiff hiking boots. I have broken the, the lower bone in my leg before uh, while playing hockey because the ankle twisted and the boot was so rigid, the boot actually broke the bone. So you can have that. If your boots are too stiff, you're not preventing an injury, you're just changing the location of the injury based on the super stiff boots. So what I recommend is if you have really weak ankles or you have medical issues with your ankles, talk to your doctor, see what they say. They may say that a little bit of support is gonna be helpful to you in your specific situation. If you don't have weak ankles, if you don't have ankle problems, low cut shoes, mid cut shoes, trail runners, hiking shoes, all of those are probably gonna be just fine for you. The added benefit is they're much lighter than hiking boots. The number that I hear most often is for every one pound on your feet, that is equal to six pounds on your back as far as the work that you do because what you're carrying on your back stays fairly steady as you walk, but your shoes, you're picking them up and moving them with each step. So the weight on your feet translates into more work for you. The lighter your shoes are, or boots if that's what you want, the better they are. If you want a different opinion on this, go check out Andy's best footwear for Philmont article and video at Andy Parish Outdoors, or it's available on gearreport.com as well. He's a little bit more objective, a little bit more middle of the road. These Ultra Lone Peak 3 mids were absolutely wonderful. They're up to the uh, Lone Peak 5 now, which has some additional improvements. Highly, highly recommended. Definitely wear whatever you're gonna wear on the trail on your shakedown hikes though, to get used to them. Especially if you go with something like the Ultras that are zero drop, because that changes the way the muscles in your leg interact with each other. 
All right, where are we coming into? We are coming into Apache Springs. Coming in hot, baby, coming in hot. <laughs> All right, inside the boots, we'll have socks. I prefer to wear right socks uh, because they're multi-layer. They have an inner layer that is wicking and an outer layer that's a little bit more absorbent. But because there are two layers that are not attached to each other, the, you, you have to have friction to get blisters. So instead of your foot rubbing up against your shoe and creating a hot spot and a blister, the two different layers of the socks can rub against each other and take some of that friction away so that you don't get blisters. I wore, this is the Escape. I wore, we'll, we'll see the other ones I wore. They're already packed in here. A couple different models. I took three pair of socks on the trail. That worked out pretty well for me. All of them were from Wright Socks. So highly recommended. These are made in the USA right here, 11 minutes from my house in Burlington, North Carolina. By Americans, for Americans. Well, for the whole world, actually. Check out Wright Sock. We've got a factory tour video up that you can find if you'd like to see how these are made. It's kind of interesting. All right, also a little bit different. As a dude, I'm wearing boxer brief type of a synthetic material so that I don't have moisture issues. They breathe real well. But I went a step further and went with Separatech underwear. Separatech, this isn't gonna help you ladies, but if you're a guy, there's a little hole here so that you keep the frank and the beans separated, so to speak. So when you're out there hiking in the desert, you get sweaty, you can get chafing issues. This type of underwear keeps everything separated so that you do not get those chafing issues. I absolutely love these, highly recommended. Again, you'll find links in our budget backpacking gear fulfillment article on gearreport.com. The shirt that I wore on the trail, two shirts, both of them are a synthetic material, light, breathable, dries super quick for sweat or if you get rained on. This happens to be for the troop that invited me to go on the trek with them, uh, Troop 49 out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Thank you so much for asking me to be a part of 618 Alpha One. That is the crew that we went in June of 2021. So there's the synthetic shirt for pants. I like to hike in shorts. So I took zip off pants, like, well, this pair from REI. This is an old pair, they've been on a few treks. They actually suffered a blowout that I had to hand stitch on the trail. For your cons project, if you do ATVs, if you ride horses or various things that they require you to have long pants in the back country, instead of carrying a pair of shorts and then a separate pair of long pants just for those activities, I recommend that you get these zip off pants where you have long pants when you need them, like when it's cold in the morning or for your cons project, but then you can zip them off while you're hiking. I like having a couple pockets, but I don't really put much in my pockets when I'm hiking because it swings around and just annoys me. But absolutely love these. These are from REI, great pants. Uh, you can find a link for them in the budget Mont Gear article. Something I did not take on the trail the Philmont Guidebook to Adventure. I highly recommend that you read this before you hit the trail. I know they issue it to you. They expect that you read it. Most people ignore it. There's actually a lot of really good information in here that will help you on the trail from preparation to, to actually getting on the trail. They recommend, for example, you know your expedition number. I have a Sharpie sitting out here so that I didn't forget to tell you, you'll see on all my gear, I have expedition number stuff on here. This says 716M for 2017, 618A1 for 2021, and it's got Crest, my last name. Anything that I wanna get back that I may misplace on the trail, I go ahead and write, here we have J Crest, 618A1. Got something. If I want it to get back to me, then I write my name on it and my expedition number so it'll get back to me. That is mentioned in here. They have a gear list in the guidebook to adventure as well. The gear list is a little out of date in my opinion. We're gonna go over some of that, but it's a great reference. I don't carry it on the trail. Reference it before you hit the trail. All right, let's dig in to the pack itself. There we go. It's set up just the way it was on the trail for me. So last few days of our trek towards the end of June, we had lots of rain, like not the typical Philmont afternoon between 2 and 3 p.m. in monsoon season, you get a downpour. That'll happen later in the summer. At this point, it's unusual, but we had several days of almost non-stop rain. It just wouldn't stop. 
So the pack cover stayed on quite a bit, even though this is a waterproof backpack. I put the pack cover on, especially at night. We set the backpacks, we disperse them around camp outside of the Bermuda Triangle, so if any critters get into them, they tear up one bag, they don't tear into a pile of bags. I put the backpack cover on there, even though it's waterproof, just to keep the stuff on the outside dry. I don't want dew on it. Maybe keep the animals out, who knows. This is an ultra sill, uh, lightweight sill, silicone impregnated nylon with a bungee around the outside to hold it tight. This particular one is from my trail company, which sadly went out of business. It's a shame because I really like some of the products like this backpack cover. There are other options listed in our budget Philmont gear article. All right, the backpack. I do not recommend this backpack for most people. I'll tell you why. This is an ultralight backpack from z -Packs. They call it the Arc Blast. The problem with ultralight, this is a DCF Dyneba Cuban Fiber ultralight backpack. The whole thing weighs 21 ounces, super light. That sounds awesome, right? You're carrying less weight. Why wouldn't everyone want that? The problem is it has a weight carrying capacity limit. This is a pack with a frame. It has these little carbon fiber rods on each side and then the flat pieces going across the top. There's none at the bottom. That's the whole frame, all right? So it has, with that tiny little carbon fiber frame, it has a very limited carrying capacity of about 25 to 30 pounds for it to be really comfortable. You get up around 35 pounds, you're starting to push the limits of, all right, it's starting to get uncomfortable. When we left base camp, I weighed my pack full of food and five liters of water and all my gear. It was 32 pounds. I was 32. well within the limit, it was very comfortable. A couple days out on the trail, one of our scouts starts to have some medical issues. He had to come off the trail. We had to divide all of his gear up among the crew and everyone had to carry extra. I carried an extra 10 or 12 pounds and that put me closer to 45, 50 pounds. This thing gets really uncomfortable when it gets over about 35 or 40 pounds of weight in it. So knowing that there are some circumstances where you may end up carrying more weight than you're planning on, Personally, I'm gonna stay away from the ultralight backpacks, probably, and stick with something that gives me at least a 45, 50 pound carrying capacity, even if it means the pack's a little bit heavier. There's some great recommendations on our budget backpacking gear for Philmont article, as well as we've got a best budget backpacks for Philmont article that has some other alternatives. You know, you need to have that comfort zone in as far as additional carrying capacity goes. So back here on this side, I've got these little clips. They call them Grimlocks. They go on a strap and lock. They're made for molly gear, like the military webbing gear. And I just slip them on each of the shoulder strap. It's got a little button that you unlock it. And I keep the hydration tube in here. So it's hanging kind of in front of me. I can put it in my mouth real easy, but if I need to get it out, I just unclip it. On the other side, I have my GoPro camera. Actually, I'm really happy with how this worked out. That same type of clip going through the webbing on the shoulder strap. And then I have this little tripod. Now, I've got a link to it in the budget Philmont Gear article. This tripod I got off of Amazon it was pretty cheap. What I really liked is it has this big ball so I can adjust the angle that the camera sits at no matter what kind of terrain it's on. If it's crooked terrain, I can just adjust the angle. So I wanted something with a ball joint, but also that really small area fits perfectly right in here for that clip. So I just clip it onto my backpack. Now what I found is hiking like this, the camera portion is a little top heavy, so it wants to go off sideways. It doesn't want to sit straight. So if I were filming, clipping it to my back with it, recording video, then I'd use these legs to kind of stabilize it a little bit up against my chest. But if I'm just carrying it, just so it doesn't flop around and uh, get in my way, I would hold it upside down. Since it's top heavy, we put the heavy part down and then uh, clip it in place. There, like that, and I'll just carry it like that. And then when it comes time to film something, I just push the button to unlock it, 
and pull it out and there it is. So I really like that. By the way, for a camera, I get lots of questions about what kind of camera should I take? I'm a big fan of taking one of the more modern GoPros. This is a GoPro Hero 5 Black, which is the oldest model that I would recommend taking. This is the first model that had pretty reasonable image stabilization. It takes pretty good still pictures. It takes pretty good video. It doesn't get pixelated with motion too easily and it has a mode in it where it's turned off. You push a record button, it will turn itself on, start recording video, and then when you push the button to stop recording, it shuts the whole thing off. So you don't have to power it up and then go start the video, and then when you're done, stop recording and then power it down. It does that all with this button on top. So I really, really like that. Got some pretty good footage with the GoPro, and I really like how it is strapped on here. That made it really easy and convenient. Last time in 2017, I had just a carabiner that I clipped around a different type of tripod. It didn't fit as well, and I was using a, a faux pro, a fake GoPro camera that didn't start and stop on the record button, and it was a lot more hassle to take the camera off, shoot some video, take some pictures, put it back. This made it super simple and easy. You see the little blue ribbon here and then the blue tag over here that says Filmot Trek Talk. It's how people in our Filmot Trek Talk Facebook group could identify each other on the trail was by having a blue ribbon on your backpack or you may have noticed on the hat, I had a little blue ribbon hanging off. That was just for identification purposes. All right, so that's the back side. On this side, you see I've got camp shoes. I'm a big Crocs fan. I used them for camping for years. I've had issues though, myself and my son both, with walking around in the woods and a little branch would come in through one of these vent holes and injure the toes. We, we both got cuts and uh, splinters and things like that. So at Philmont, there's stuff everywhere, rocks, twigs, stumps, sticks, whatever. I wanted something without any vent holes, but was still ventilated to let the sweaty feet breathe. These water shoes work perfect for that. We didn't actually, well, I didn't actually use them for water crossings. We did a few stream crossings, one or two where, where shoes actually got in the water a little bit. You're other people stopped, pulled their boots and socks off and put their camp shoes on. I was just careful where I stepped. I do pretty good about not falling in the water. I didn't end up with water over my shoes, so it wasn't a big deal. I just used them as camp shoes and shower shoes when we were on the trail. I've also got my poncho here. Philmont says they don't recommend ponchos, and the, the explanation I've been given over and over is, well, if we say ponchos are okay, people are gonna bring the little like $1 emergency plastic ponchos because it's a poncho. And I'm like, really? You, you think people are stupid? Because you tell people bring a backpack, you tell people bring rain gear, you tell people to bring other stuff, and you don't have all the specifications on it. You assume they're gonna be smart enough to know, don't bring the $1 emergency poncho. But apparently some people have, so I'll, I'll lay out for you what you need. This is a silicon impregnated nylon backpacking poncho. Backpacking poncho has an extended flap in the back so that when it starts raining, you grab it off your pack, like usually if your pack has a brain compartment or someplace you can get to it easy, you grab it, open it up, put your head through, flip it up over, the poncho goes over your backpack and you in one motion, whereas a regular poncho wouldn't have that extra length in the back to cover your backpack as well. All right, we're headed back to base camp. And I'd like to introduce you to my new friends. Hi. Hey. 404. They're lost. What? 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 No one can find them. <laughs> True. True not found. Yo, like and subscribe for YouTube. This one is from my trail company, which is no longer made. I apologize. I've got links in the budget film backpacking gear article to backpacking ponchos you can get today. I really like ponchos because they're very well ventilated. You can put them on without taking your backpack off. You can take them off without taking your backpack off. I know a lot of people like rain suits. A lot of people love rain pants. Yeah, I've tried all different types of rain gear. The only thing that breathes well enough, because I sweat a lot, are 
ponchos because they're very well ventilated. Any kind of rain suit, even Gore-Tex rain suits, even rain suits with pit zippers and crotch zippers and everything, they don't breathe enough. I end up just as wet from sweat as if I were out in the rain. So the poncho works best for me. A lot of people like Frog Togs rain suits. You can get them for about 25 bucks for the top and the bottom. Have you seen a bear yet? Um, no, on the floor. You did, what was his name? Just like that. They'll keep you dry-ish in a rainstorm. They actually breathe reasonably well. I bought a set for the last, uh, for the 2017 trek and was installing pit zippers in them to give them a little better ventilation when this poncho came in. And this worked better for me, so I went with that. If you do fog talks, understand they're not as durable as some rain suits. You gotta be more careful with them. You can use them as your long pants for your cons project or horse rides or ATV rides. They're not gonna be as durable. If you get a rip in them, there goes your rain gear. And then if you get in a cold rain like we did last week, you may have hypothermia issues. So think about uh, the pros and cons of different types of rain gear when you're deciding which one to take. Also here on the outside, you'll see an REI pack towel. I use this as a washcloth. And this other one, very similar, it's actually sold as a golf towel. I use that as the towel. So when we hit a backcountry shower, at you know, some of the staff camps like Bobian and Cimarron-Cito have them. Um, Clark's Fork, for example. Use one for washcloth, one for a towel, get my shower, I don't have to carry a big towel. I don't have to air dry. So that worked out pretty well for me. Uh, you can see here, platypus bag here, a one liter collapsible platypus water bottle sits on this side. I also have a two liter or a three liter Hydropack soft side water bladder that I can carry here as well. And it just fits right under these little straps to hold it in place. I started out with the three liter and then uh, once we got uh, to where we were, had lots of water sources, I switched it to the one liter on that side. On the other side, I had two smart water bottles. You see they're kind of crushed from being in the plane on the flight back. This one has the pop top on it, so you just uh, you pull it with my teeth, squirt it in my mouth, pop it closed, put it back. This one has a prototype of a new hydration tube adapter system. It came with the tube that you see clipped in here. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, 3D printed plastic, the threads on the inside, after being tightened down a few times, they failed. So I can hold it in place. I, I can hike with it and drink out of the bottle like this. Uh, but if I bend over to get something, then the water comes out and runs down my back, which I don't like. So I'm gonna have to give the manufacturer some feedback on that and shame on me for taking a prototype product out on a real trek. I know better, I shouldn't have done that, but I did. I also put this little glasses strap on here to remind me, uh, I wore it on these glasses so that on the trail they didn't fall off. There are a lot of places if your glasses fall off, you may never see them again. They fall in a river, a stream, down a crevice while you're bouldering. Um, it's just better to have a glasses strap. I got this at the Tooth of Time Traders in 2017. It's been on two treks now, and it's just a little minimalist elastic stretchy glasses strap and it worked beautifully. These tags are your backcountry pass that you're not supposed to be in the backcountry unless you have one of these. And then the Philmont uh, mask guidelines and participant code of conduct for the COVID rules are in place for 2021, all that ridiculousness. I had a little backup emergency flashlight here. I. Once again, two treks in a row, I never used it, but it's so light that I kept it just in case my main flashlight failed. I had a little bit of something there. I heard that was all these things on the other three sides. Now we get to the back. We have in this pack one big pouch. I put everything in there, but it's organized. So let, let's, it's not pure madness. Let's go through. This is tucked in loose, my seat pad. I don't believe in carrying a camp chair because when the chairs come out, people sit down, they don't get stuff done. Of course. The camp chair army set their chairs up before the work's done, but that's how they work, right? People get lazy when the chairs come out. Plus, it, they're a pound or two pounds or three pounds. This is like two and a half ounces, and it gives me padding. Every campsite at Philmont and most places, there are tree stumps. There are logs that are sitting up on the end. There are trees that are laying horizontally on the ground. There are uh, rocks, mounds of dirt. All kinds of things you can sit on. Where are we? 
Bobian. Bobian. All right. How are you feeling, Will? Uh, sometimes you don't want to get dirty, so you put your little plastic, you know, rubber sit pad down. And now, if it's dirty, if it's wet, whatever, your butt's not getting wet. Plus, it gives you a little bit of padding. Um, that is easily the way to go for me. I own some backpacking camp chairs, and I take them sometimes when I'm doing other types of camping. At Philmont, there's too much to do in the backcountry. Faster! Right here. There, now set him down. If you're sitting in your chair, you're missing out on other things and it's just unnecessary weight. Um, people say, oh, but I'm so tired at the end of the day, I need my chair. Well, guess what? Don't carry heavy stuff like a backpacking chair. You won't be so tired. Then you won't feel like you need the chair. Camping chairs, backpacking chairs at Philmont, self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't like them. Carry it if you want. We actually have articles to help you figure out which one's right for you if you want one. I carry them on other trips, but not at Philmont. All right, the main thing I have in here, one big bag. This is like a two or two and a half gallon Ziploc hefty freezer type bag. In here are all my smellable items. So when we get to camp, this is where organization comes in. Two things I'm getting out immediately when we get to camp. My smellables bag out of this pouch, and then I'll pop this open and pull out my food bag from the main compartment inside. And then put those in the bear bag pile so they can go up in the bear bags immediately before we set anything else up in camp. And this is how you do bear bags. The organization here, I had some extra Ziploc bags in here any smellable stuff, so my cooking items. This Fossil's origami plate, super light. It's all you need at Philmont. It is flat, and then you can button the corners up and turn it into a plate. They have three different models. There's a plate, a bowl, and a cup. I think the kit with all three of them is like 15 bucks, so they're super cheap. They weigh next to nothing. I clip this Sea to Summit aluminum spork. It's the long version of the spork on here, so they don't get lost, so they stay together. And there are a variety of companies like Tokes that make a titanium version. For the cost and the weight difference, it's negligible. Sometimes the titanium ones are even heavier than this aluminum. This is the best one I have found, the one that I like. And and if you're eating out of the bags, uh, any of the rehydrated food at Philmont, some of the bags actually have instructions for how to rehydrate in the bag. The long version is important. Again, these are on the best budget backpacking gear for Philmont article with links, so you can find them all and get whatever you like there. Gold Bond powder I like for a little bit of uh, moisture absorption, odor reduction, friction, dissipation. I put it in my shoes. I'll even shake it down the drawers in the front for that morning tingle. Here's a little warning. Don't refill it with anti-monkey butt powder and then take it on the trail because then you'll shake it and you won't get the tingle and you'll feel let down the rest of the day, okay? So I hear, as far as you know. All right, gold bomb powder. That goes in the smellables bag. I had my little sewing kit in there uh, just because it's easy to get to if I keep it in that bag. It's not a smellable. I did use the needle and thread twice once on my stuff sack and once to sew up about a foot and a half or longer tear in the front of my pants. I hand stitched those on the trail because I have my sewing kit with me. I think you need one sewing kit per crew and this is actually the one for our crew. I just happen to supply it. More Ziploc bags. My Fruity Pebbles, this is all my medications. I put them all in one bag. Like you have to take them in the original containers when you go to MedCheck so you can see everything you're taking and check expiration dates. But then I pour everything in one bag and then each morning I open it and pull out, you know, okay, one allergy pill, my glucosamine and my vitamins. And then I also have some Benadryl in here in case anyone has allergy issues, which both of our crews on this last trek had 
some allergy issues and needed Benadryl, so that was good. Most years, I have told people don't bother with insect repellent. It is, uh, mosquitoes and ticks and things aren't an issue in the back country of Philmont. Uh, you can see all of the little scabby scars and things on my legs that will tell you this year was different. There were little noceums or chiggers or whatever out at lower altitudes that tore my ankles and many other people's ankles up. So uh, I realized this before we hit the trail. I went to the two of the time traders, got this Benz insect repellent. I got the little wipes because it was lighter and easier to carry. That went in the smellables bag as well. And I used them, they worked pretty well. Um, probably should have used them more towards the end of the trek and then I wouldn't have all these dots on my ankles. This is my personal first aid kit, which is basically a blister kit, plus a couple little over-the-counter meds for like cold symptoms, and uh, but mainly like moleskin, a couple of uh, Band-Aids, a few Q-tips. So if my nose dried out and started bleeding, I could take the um, lip balm, which is actually over here in this little hip pouch and get a little bit on a Q-tip and put it on the inside of my nose to keep it moist so it wouldn't bleed. That, that's a good tip for you. It's very dry, typically, and low humidity, and a lot of people get nosebleeds in the back country at Fillmore. Contact kit, although I ended up not using my contacts at all, I just wore my glasses because your hands get nasty, and I didn't want to deal with nasty hands putting contacts in. Camp Suds are the soap that is issued to you by Philmont uh, at the commissary to do your dishes. Uh, I carried that in the Smellables bag. Actually, carried it in a little Ziploc in the Smellables bag. So if it leaked, it didn't get everywhere. Cliff Bar, I put this wrapper in because I really like the cool mint chocolate Cliff Bar. That came out of my snack bag. So each meal and swap box you run into, you'll get things that maybe you don't eat right away, you wanna save for later. Got a bunch of drink mixes, a power bar, uh, some mustard and pickle relish, all of those things in one little bag. So if I needed a snack, I just pull that out. I could choose from whatever's in there. So here's my toothbrush and toothpaste and a few little toothpicks. I, uh, I carry a full-size toothbrush. I know a lot of people will cut them down to make them lighter and smaller. And I figure, you know what, I'm a big guy. I can carry a full-size toothbrush. So there it is. I carried this travel-size toothpaste. It was completely full when I left. It's three-fourths full after a two-week, you know, 12-day trek plus a couple days in base camp because you use very little, just enough to make your mouth not taste nasty. You, you're not using a normal amount when you're on the trail. These little toothpicks are great for clearing out the little, uh, there's a lot of granola type stuff in the Philmont meals and they get stuck between your teeth. So these little, I had a couple of these picks to, to help deal with that. Let's see, this is the MicroPure water purification tablets that Philmont issues. This, there are 10 of them here. So there's a one, two in each section and there are five sections, so that's 10 and they'll give you instructions on how to use them. It's very easy, very simple. And you'll notice as we go through this, you won't find a filter of any type. This is all we used on the last trek. And that sounds weird to me because I have been a water filter evangelist in the past and encouraged people to take them and not use the MicroPure. This crew this year decided against my recommendation that we use my Platypus Gravity Works uh, filter system, they said, you know what, we're just gonna use the tablets. And you know what? It worked perfectly. I had absolutely no issues with it. The crew had no issues with it. It's easy, it's simple, the water tasted fine. Uh, we didn't have any problems with having to wait a few minutes uh, for, the, for the tablets to work, at least 30 minutes. So I recommend that now. All of these things, the smellable items, are in a bag that has my expedition number and my name, goes on the outside of my pack. So when we get to camp, I just grab that bag and all of this stuff goes up in a bear bag together. I don't have to go through 26 different pouches and pockets to get things. Uh, the only exceptions to that would be if I put anything in the hip pouches on my backpack or in the pockets of my pants. So like I have sunscreen, lip balm, and insect repellent wipes in this pouch. The other one had my camera stuff. So I had the little GoPro on the shoulder strap. On this side, I had a couple toothpicks, 
a mask because they were making us wear masks at certain staff camps. Good to see you're so happy this morning. Um, wait, I can fix that. No. <laughs> and then uh, sometimes I'd have my little battery charger block. I've got a, a list of a variety of battery chargers and capacities and what's the best weight versus uh, electrical capacity. They're all on the budget Philmont backpacking gear. This is the charger for the GoPro batteries with some spare batteries in it. And just in case we ran across a plug where I could plug in and charge the camera, although we never did. So those were all in their separate little Ziploc in the hip pouch. So if they needed to go up in the bear bag, when we stopped, I'd just pull those out, drop them in this bag, and then that's sealed up. It's got my name on it. It goes in the crew uh, oops bag or bear bag, and it's easy to get out when we're done because it's all in one bag. So again, that little bit of organization goes a long way. I didn't personally carry this, but we had uh, in our crew gear a deuce of spades. This is the original that is uh, 0.6 ounces. They, they had the deuce of spades three, which is almost a full ounce, a little bit more heavy duty. Worked great, even though the, the uh, terrain's pretty rocky up there. The only other thing I had on the outside, this little pouch, separate from my smellables, has some Wilderness First Aid cheat sheets here, right on the outside, along with the Philmont Medical Emergency phone number. Uh, so that sat right here where it was visible. If there was ever any incident on the trail where we needed it, someone could yank it out, go through the cheat sheets to make sure they weren't missing anything from a wilderness first aid standpoint. All right, in here, I also had a ink pen down here, the passport journal that Philmont issues, where as you go to different base camps, you can get it stamped and you can write in your journal. You can see I wrote a lot and got a lot of stamps in here. And then I also had a printed copy of our itinerary and itinerary map so that I could refer to that as we went to make sure, you know, I knew what was coming later in the day, the next day, whatever. Again, this was uh, on the outside where it was easy to get to because of the passport stamp book. When we'd show up at a staff camp and go up for the porch talk, I would grab this and then I'd grab my snack bag out of here and then I could go swap stuff at the swap box, get my passport stamped and it was all super easy and convenient. All right, and then when it came time to put it all away, just wrap it up like this, tuck it down in here, easy. All right, that wraps up everything on the outside. So now, let's look on the inside. Let us know if you have any questions in the comments. A big thanks to our patrons for helping us bring you more unbiased, hands-on reviews. Thank you.